Good morning, everyone. I want you to take 60 seconds to greet somebody today. Matter of fact, stand up and hug, greet somebody, warm each other up this morning. Come on now, stand up, take 60 seconds to stand up, and hug somebody this morning. <clears throat> Amen. Take, hug somebody. Let them know you love them. This is a happy Sabbath. Greet somebody. <clears throat> Greet somebody. And we're going to have you stand up again in just a few minutes. It's good to get a little workout. Amen. Welcome to camp meeting. Welcome everybody here to the camp meeting. Welcome General Conference President. Welcome to you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We want to bow our heads for a word of prayer before we get into this lesson. It has been a blessing uh, to God's people this Sabbath school lesson. Am I right, church? This is one of the most powerful Sabbath school lessons uh, that I have studied. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless your word today as we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to ask you another big favor, and this is in accordance with the Sabbath school lesson to motivate and excite us. We're going to ask you to stand up one more time and repeat the words after me. Come on, church. Everybody stand up in the balcony. One more time. Everybody stand up. You stand up to wake up. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. Stand up to wake up. All right. I want you to repeat after me. By God's grace. I will be a better witness in my home, on my job, in my community, in my church, and for my God, by God's grace. Now sit down. God bless you. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Our friends, uh, I got convicted studying this lesson. And how many of you know that it's high time that the Adventist church in America wakes up? The Adventist church in America, it is high time that we wake up. Amen, church. I was reading a devotional book for men by Dwight Haynes, I believe, Dwight Nelson, Dwight Nelson. And he said, if we are not ready for the second coming of the Holy Spirit, then we will not be ready for the second coming of Jesus. And so, friends, the latter rain is the coming that we want. We want to get wet by the latter rain, because if we don't get wet by the latter rain, we will die dry. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of dry Christians. Amen. We want to be wet. Look at somebody say, I want to be wet. I want the latter rain. I want to be prepared for the second coming of the Holy Spirit so that I can be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the Sabbath school lesson title is what, everybody? Releasing into ministry. Romans, the 10th chapter in verse 15, someone can come to the mic and read that. And by the way, to save time, we have official questions that we need to ask as I go throughout this presentation. And you know who you are, those with the official questions. Uh, those who do not have the official questions, just listen and we'll tell you uh, if there's an opportunity for that. But right now, we need to uh, continue going. Yes? You want to read it? Oh, you brave. Come on up here. All right, all right, read, read to us. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings 
of good things. Hey, Amen. She read that so well, she deserve a hand clap. Hey, Amen. Beautiful. Man, she sounds like she's getting ready to preach. I like that. Hey, Amen. Hey, Amen. Now, now, this text is a powerful text. And it is very true that not everyone can preach. Not everyone is called to preach. That's why sometimes on Sabbath, you may skip church if the wrong person is speaking. Because you realize that not everyone is anointed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness, friend? But it is also true that even though not everyone can preach, everyone can reach. Aren't you glad that somebody reached out to you? Reach out and touch somebody's hands, amen? Make this world a better place if you can. Now, let, I'm going to ask another question. If you are a first-generation Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you either came to the church by invitation, by a revival, or by a crusade, stand up. If you are first-generation and remain standing, balcony at the bottom, if you came to the church by revival, crusade, now look around those settings. Look around. Don't tell me evangelism does not work. Amen. Continue to stand. Continue to stand. Look around, everybody. The Adventist church would be pretty lonely without us. Can I get a witness, friends? The first generation. Give the Lord a hand clap. You see, evangelism, and a matter of fact, not only would the Adventist church be lonely without the first generation Adventist, uh, the Adventist church would be dead without the first generation Adventist because evangelism is the life of the church. Can I get a witness, friends? It's the life of the church. I'm a result of an evangelistic effort, friends. I thank God that some 30 years ago, somebody knocked on my door. Can I get a witness, friend? Uh, uh, and even though Pastor Humphrey was the one to baptize me, it was his wife that knocked on my door. Is she here? Is Sister Humphrey here? His wife that knocked on my, if you're here, Sister Humphrey, stand up. His wife knocked on my door. And if she had not knocked on my door, then I wouldn't be standing before you today. My wife wouldn't be here with me. Are you with me, friends? She would be in another conference somewhere. She met me here at Oakwood. My brother and, and his, his wife wouldn't be here right there today. My younger brother, my older brother, wouldn't be in California today and his wife. The knock is a powerful thing. Can I get a witness, friend? My mother, I mean, my older brother was the first, then it was me, then the rest of the family. Mother, Pentecostal missionary, came through for God. Mother, and then my sister ended up marrying an Adventist preacher over in the Central States Conference, all because of a knock. Evangelism works, friends. You cannot convince me otherwise, and I thank God that I was raised in the Pentecostal church for at least 15 years of my life because in that church I was taught to respect the Bible. And because I respected the Bible, when the Bible was preached, I couldn't help but say, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Aren't you glad, friends, to be in the Adventist church today? A church, friends, that teaches all of God's commandments. A church, friends, that believes in the Old as well as the New Testament. Can I get a witness, friends? A church that believes that we have a mission and we, are all, we have a message that nobody else has. That's why nobody can preach like a Holy Ghost filled Adventist preacher, because we got too much. They wish what we they wish they had what we have, friends. Sad to say they don't have it, but they can. Just be in the next baptism, amen. Now let's continue on. Let me, let, let, let me ask you another question because I'm going somewhere here. Don't want to get too carried away here. I'm going somewhere. If a pastor knocked on your door and you came to the church, stand up. 
if a pastor knocked on your door? Look around. I don't believe I see anybody standing up. That ought to let you know right there that preachers don't do all the work. God has called the church to do the work. Can I get a witness, friends? We don't want to give too much credit to the preachers because the preachers would have nobody to preach to had not somebody knocked on the door. Can I get a witness, friends? All right, Sunday's lesson. Sunday's lesson. Sunday's lesson. Somebody come up here real quick or to the mic and read Exodus 18, 17, and 18. It's just talking about a shared responsibility. This brings us right into what I was just saying. Shared responsibility. Exodus 18, quickly, quickly. To the mic, come on. All right, we got a lady here. Come on, we got to do this quickly. Father, as we read your word, bless your word with your spirit. In your name, amen. Read it real loud, sis. And Moses, father-in-law, said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, but thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Amen. Did you get that? Moses was allowing his ministry to kill him. His father-in-law said, you cannot do this alone. You're counseling and praying with people all day. You're taking too much on yourself. You need some help. How many of you know, friends, that in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom? We need help, friends. He gave him advice, and Moses was not so stubborn that he could not listen to the advice of his father-in-law. He took the advice, and he ran with it. But at first, Moses was acting like the Lone Ranger. But how many of you know, friends, that every Lone Ranger needs a tanto? Can I get a witness, friend? Amen. Because it is possible to show selfishness in the ministry. It's possible to show selfishness in the ministry. That's why some people will leave the church, friends, if they do not get reelected for a certain office. <laughs> Marriage is to death do you part, not a church office. Can I get a witness, friend? Not a church offer. We are called to share the load. Now, evangelism, the book Evangelism, page 104, says, Let not one man feel that his gift alone is sufficient for the work of God. Did you get that? Amen. All right, we have a question here. Question number one. One. What should preachers do if they see people leaving the church? All right. First off, it's not the preacher's fault alone because it's not his responsibility alone. Amen. If new converts leave the church and you have to ask where they are, that's rebuke on you. You don't know where they are? That's a rebuke on you, friends. It's not a rebuke on the preacher. It's a rebuke on the church because you did not notice them until they left. Amen. No exchange of phone numbers, no dinner invitations, no reaching out. Dinner invitation is not just to feed somebody's stomach and make somebody's stomach happy. Dinner invitations is to uh, strengthen somebody in the fellowship of the church. It is actually a ministry. Friends, if you have people over at your house for dinner, that is a ministry. It is deeper than Vegelinks and striplets and choplets and all that kind of stuff. Or chicken and for those who serve. Amen. It's deeper than that. Amen, friends. It's deeper than that. All right, we have another question. Question number two. All right, here it comes. 
Does it take more work to keep folk than to bring them in? Or we bring them in too quickly? Can you hear me? All right. First off, who are we to judge a baptism? Amen. Who are we to judge a baptism? Because we don't know how the Holy Spirit has been dealing with folk. We don't know the groundwork that the Holy Spirit has already covered with folk. I baptized a, a, a lady some years ago in her 80s. She was an old Baptist. And you know sometimes when they are old like that and they're stuck in their ways, sometimes it's hard for them to respond to the Adventist message quickly. And when I gave the appeal, this woman stood up quickly for baptism. She was a powerful member in the Baptist church. I was wondering, even though I believe I gave a pretty good revelation seminar, I was saying, this woman stood up quick. I found out she was a faithful listener to 3ABN for years. They had already, the Holy Spirit had just already laid out the territory. The only thing I had to do was just give the appeal. And the same with a man that we just recently baptized. He said that his neighbor uh, was not able to get their BN, but he accidentally got it. And it just played on his TV. We baptized him. We don't know what the Holy Spirit does. We think that the Holy Spirit works on people as soon as they come into church here. Way before. And so that's why we ought to be careful in judging baptism. Now, I admit, some may get baptized a little too quick, but we ought to be careful because we don't know for sure and we should not judge. It's so easy to step back and look and judge. Oh, they baptized that person too quick. How do we know we didn't baptize you too quick? Huh? How do we know? And we only take an official question, but we'll get back with as soon as we can. Thank you very much. How do we know? You can have a seat, but we get back with you when we can. How do we know? We don't know, friends. And then we love to say stuff like, uh, uh, the folk haven't been taught enough. Y'all want to know the truth? It's not that they haven't been taught enough. In a lot of cases, they haven't been loved enough. They haven't been loved enough a lot of kids. Because if you've been to the seminars every night, you'll realize the truth has been being taught. Sometimes it's because they haven't been loved enough, friends. Saying happy Sabbath to a new convert or visitor is not enough. With your little big hat on, uh, your nice suit and shirt, and you're talking, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Friends, that's not enough. All dressed up. Friends, it's good to be dressed up for Sabbath, but we got to do more than say happy Sabbath for people. We got to love people. Can I get a witness, friends? We got to love people. You know, we put new believers through trauma when we pick them up for crusades. But when the crusade is over, we tell them they have to find a ride. We act like we retire after the crusade. You act like you're so tired after the preacher was the one doing the preaching. What you tired for? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we act like we so tired. I put in three weeks. They used to put in all summers. And then when some folk come to the meeting, they, they, they just look. They stay on the side. They let the visitors come sit in the middle while they're on the side. That's not evangelism. You got to mingle with the people. Don't sit on the side like you know it all. And then all the, pre the preacher, poor preacher preaching and preaching, and then you're just looking at them, not praying, not saying amen, not, not rude, just looking. I mean, the poor preacher is up there sweating and kicking and all that kind of stuff. All kind, and, and then you just looking. I mean, give me some amen support. Can I get a witness for We need some amen support. We need to build a relationship with new converts. And if we do, then we don't have to ask where they are. If you need to see a new convert setting alone, 
And you don't want to move from your special pew. Your special pew. At least tell them to come and sit with you. They'll feel important, friends. Amen. Sheep stick together. And this special pew thing, man, it, it gets me, friends, how folk fall them. If you want the pew so badly, buy it. Buy the pew. You want the pew so badly, buy it. You know, they, they had what you call rent, a rent a pew at one time, renting pews and all that stuff. That, that was back in the days. But if you want to buy a pew, just write it on the tithe envelope. Buy, buy a pew. If, if, if it's that special to you, then buy We got too many folks under pew addiction. We're talking about, Lord, deliver me from this addiction. We need to be delivered from pew addiction. Getting all mad up in church because somebody, somebody took your pew? Lord, save us from our addictions, including pew addiction. Some folk just want to get you mad and will purposely sit in your particular seat. Just to push your button, am I right? You got to surprise them and don't react like the preacher said last. She said, don't react. Just a bell come there, come strutting down and sit right in your pew. I'm going to see what she going to say. They just trying to test you, friends. That's how the devil is to try to ruin your happy Sabbath. Question number three. Question number three. Official question, question number three. All right, here it comes. Question number three. Remember, official question. How do you know if you're a good tree? All right. How do you know? Well, somebody read the answer for that in Matthew 7, 17, and 18. Somebody uh, quickly read the answer for that. Matthew 7, 17, and 18. Somebody, anybody can come for this, for the scriptures. Anybody can come for the scriptures here. All right. You coming up, young man? Oh, good, 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 yeah. Come on. Amen. Say amen for the young man. Pray. Amen. <laughs> All right. You're on? You're on? Yes. Right. And it reads, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Amen. That's your answer right there, friends. Either a good tree... Or your bad tree. And then verse 20 of that says, by your fruits, you should know them. By your fruits, you should know yourself too. Amen. Amen. And, and you, can, you can know yourself uh, by how you drive. You can know yourself by how you drive. If you cut people in front of you on the way to camp meeting, then you are a mean person. Talking about happy Sabbath with your mean self, amen. <laughs> if you don't let people get in front of you while you're driving, you just don't like it when they get in front of you. Then you are a selfish person. If you drive fast all the time, then you are an impatient person. If someone cuts in front of you and then you get mad because they cut in front of you and then you quickly turn your steering wheel and you hit the gas and you pull out in front of them and then you hit the brakes <laughs> just to teach them a lesson for cutting in front of you, then you are a vindictive person. God says vengeance is mine. You not God. Can I get a witness, friend? That's God's job. Amen. All right. All right. I, I love these lessons, you know. Uh, it is not road rage, it's rage. Now, notice the Bible says in Galatians, if you glance over there, but in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says fruits are fruit. It says fruit, not fruits fruit. Either you have it all or you have nothing. 
It's almost like the principle of if you break one, you break all. It's a package deal. Because you cannot have joy and not have peace. If you have joy, you will have peace. Amen. You cannot have meekness and not have temperance. You cannot have long suffering and not have gentleness. In other words, you spoil one, you spoil all. Amen. All right, next question. Question, uh, yeah, next question, question number four. Question number four. Pastor Owens, how can church leaders grow sound trees? All right, how can church leaders grow sound trees? Well, church leaders should first make sure that they are sound trees. Amen. As a church leader myself, I always have to check myself and see how sound I am so that I'm not a hypocrite standing in front of the people. Amen. So church leaders should be sound. And then if you study the lesson, you'll realize that uh, church leaders should utilize as many gifts in church as possible. We don't, we don't play favorites. Amen. We ought not play favorites. Amen. We utilize as many gifts as possible. Some of the best talents are still in the pews. Our job is to lead, to teach, and to train. We lead by example, amen? Everything that I tell my members to do, and some of them are here now, I try my best to do. If I tell my members to go out and knock on doors, I've already done it. As a matter of fact, I told Elder Edmonds a couple months back, I told him, I hold a record that I don't believe any preacher holds. And he said, and what is that? I said, the record I hold is, no matter where I have lived, whether it's Kentucky or Tennessee, no matter where I have lived, I have always had my neighbors to come visit my church. No matter where I've lived, I've always had my neighbors to come to my church, sometimes several of them, because I believe, how can I tell you to preach the gospel in all the world as a leader, and I cannot even go to my neighbors? And let me tell you something, church. We always say we want to go into all the world as a church. But imagine if all the Adventists in all the world just went to their neighbors. Give them a Bible answer, warm them up, give them a piece of pie or something, and warm them up, and then bang, invite them to the meeting. And the meeting, if they come, that's a star in your crown. Can I get a witness, friends? We got to reach out to people. Some of you look at me like you're crazy. That's all right. You better go and visit your neighbor after this great camp meeting. You got so much Holy Ghost. Let's show it. Amen, friends. Now, now, here's another thing that we need to keep in mind. Here's another thing. As we witness to our neighbors, some of us cannot witness to our neighbors because we have been a bad tree. I mean, if your neighbor heard you and your wife fussing and cursing, it's pretty hard to all of a sudden come around and, would you come to the real life crusade tonight? If you've been bad on your job, you just curse somebody out. Isn't it kind of hard to tell them, would you come to the Bible restoration crusade next week? If you've been a bad tree, friends, it's kind of hard to be a good witness. Can I get a witness? It's kind of hard. Some of us have been what we call Babylon witnesses. Babylon. Now, this is a new one. I got this from nobody. The Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, the Holy Ghost gives me a lot of stuff anyway. Amen. And some of us have been Babylon witnesses because we have been confusing people about the church by how we live. I mean, if one, listen to me closely, if one person says, I'm going to keep the Sabbath, in Huntsville, for example, one Adventist, 
And then another Adventist tells the boss, I can work this Sabbath. Then you have just caused Babylonian confusion. You need to come out of Babylon in your witness. Come out of Babylon in your witness and stop confusing folks saying, I thought an Adventist did this, but I'm looking at you and you doing this. You confusing me. I'm all caught up in Babylon. You're supposed to be telling folks, come out of Babylon, but you contributed to my Babylonian mentality. Now I'm trying to teach. Are you still with me? How many minutes I got? I got five minutes? Okay, I got five minutes. All right. Tuesday lesson. <laughs> Tuesday lesson. Matching the ministries. Matching the ministries. Now, how many of you know that God is a God of order? He's a God of order. Matter of fact, the prophet says that the angels are not authorized to bless confusion. They're not. You're coming up in church on Sabbath morning. Oh, well, I'm going to do this. What am I going to do? Uh, what's scripture? What's scripture? What's offering? What am I going to do? Let's, let's hurry up. Get up. I mean, all that confusion. And then when you run late, then you have the nerves to say, well, the Holy Ghost. Friends, sometimes it's not the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it's you holding up time. Are you with me? All right, now we're talking about matching. Let me, let me keep rolling. Uh, Acts, the sixth chapter, and verse three. Somebody read that quickly. Now, God is a God of unity, and he creates unity within diversity. No two flowers are just alike, and every leaf on a tree differs from every other leaf. Different ministries to create unity in the church. Someone read Acts 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye not, no, I'm sorry, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. All right, we're talking about matching the ministry. Not everybody could do the same ministry here as we've been reading. And they were having trouble here in the book of Acts. And they said, we need seven men. They became the seven deacons, the seven first deacons. They was full of the Holy Ghost and so forth. And in verse 1 of Acts 6, it says, to give you background, that the widows needed help. Now, listen. The first job of a deacon was not to collect money but to minister to the widows. The first job of a deacon was to minister to the widows. They were the true men in black. And deacons, you have underestimated yourselves. You are more than just collecting offering. You are more than that. God has called you, filled you with the Holy Ghost and said you need to go and help the single women help those in need I have equipped you you are more than what you are living up to be the true men in black that God has called you to be amen and if you're that then Moses can do his job one lady said that the uh, uh, her preacher, this is a very large church, she said her preacher cuts her along. I said, that's a good thing. But what about the man in black? The preacher needs time for the word of God. Sometimes some of us think all preachers do is eat, preach, and sleep. But you, don't not, you do not know that it takes about 30 hours to make a good 30-minute sermon. Am I right, preachers? Say amen, preachers. Now, if you've been doing it, if you haven't been doing it, don't say amen. <laughs> but it takes more than that, friends. And, and let me tell you, if your church members do not like you, may it not be because you do not feed them. 
Amen. We preachers, we have time to feed folks the word of God. Amen. Amen. And I got to say something for the members before they set me down because time is, is winding. Sometimes we like to complain on Sabbath that the, if the preacher doesn't do what we want him to do. And we like to leave church and say, I didn't get fed today. <laughs> you had six days to eat. <laughs> Why? Why all of a sudden you pick the Sabbath to be spiritually sensitive to your spiritual diet. You wait to the Sabbath to all of a sudden become, why weren't you spiritually sensitive on Sunday? On Monday? On Tuesday? Or as a Baptist preacher would say, on Wednesday? Or the Pentecostal preacher would say, on Thursday, huh? Or as Joel Osteen would say, and on Friday. And then that good old Adventist preacher on Sabbath. And on Sabbath, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Can I get a witness, friend? Don't be a hypocrite and all of a sudden act like you too have uh, been eating all week. And then try to blame the preacher because he didn't serve it up to you on Sabbath. You don't deserve any food on Sabbath if you didn't eat all week. Amen, friends. Coming in here empty, man. God wants the church to come in here fat and full so that we can uh, bring the Holy Spirit up in here. But if you come in all week with your cup empty, talking about fill my cup, you should have been praying fill my cup through the week. It's hard to fill an empty cup. You ought to come in at least with a cup halfway full. Can I get a witness, friend? That's why some of you too dead. That's why some of you too dead to say amen, because you come in here empty. Your cup can't run over. It's got to be full for your cup to run over. And on Sabbath, your cup can run over. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Question number five, if y'all will let me just one minute, it's about 10 o'clock, and I got to sit down. They give me one more minute, I guess. Uh, question number five, quickly. Question Pastor, number five. Pastor Owens, what if a person wants to do everything? How can we help them to stay in their lane? All right. All right. When people want to have their hands in everything in church, and you have them in every church, amen. It is either because no one else is coming to the plate or they are hogging up the plate on purpose. Both are bad because we represent a team. Can I get a witness, friends? Wednesday's lesson. We're not going to finish this, but that's why you got to study during the week. Amen. You're going to be upset if you already studied it. Talking about we didn't get through the lesson. You didn't get through the lesson all week, some of you. Amen. <laughs> Am I right? My life today, this is talking about spiritual growth in the ministry. My life today, page 103, says the only way to grow in grace is to be interestedly doing the uh, work of Christ and doing it the way he has enjoined us to do. That's the only way to spiritually grow is to do the work of Christ. You cannot grow and just sit down in the pew. Everybody needs to do something. Amen. Everybody needs to do something, friends. Everybody needs to do something for God. We have our parts to play, and we must do something for God. You say, all I'm doing, brother preacher, is sitting in the pew. Friends, if you're sitting in the pew to listen so that you can go out and tell somebody, that's not all you're doing. Amen? Well, friends, it's about almost time for me to wrap this thing up. But God bless you. I have run out of gas. <laughs> Goodbye. God bless you. Be ready when Jesus comes. Amen. <laughs>